what kind of problem is a city? When we ask what kind of problem is a city, what we're asking is really how we conceive of cities. And it's an interesting question. The reason that we ask it is because how we understand what a city is influences how we can study it and what we can learn. Is a city the built environment? The buildings, roads, sewers, and a power grid? If so, our problems might be those of design, durability, and scale. Is a city a conglomeration of people, those who live and work together? If so, our questions might be about demographics, wealth distribution, race, or immigration. Is a city a series of relationships between people, between people in the built environment, or between people in space? In that case, our problems might be related to crime and justice, access to resources, or neighborhood cohesion. Finally, is a city a region bounded on a map by lines and connected to a broader landscape? In that case, we might be interested in sustainability, growth, supply chains, and transportation. Those of us who study cities are usually gripped by just one of these questions, but we recognize the interconnectedness of the problems. Anthropology, the social science field that studies human culture, human biology, and the human past, has been heavily invested in thinking about the kind of problem a city is. Like most scholars who study or work in cities, it probably won't surprise you to learn that anthropologists are interested in a wide range of questions regarding the problem of cities. Archaeology, the subdiscipline of anthropology that studies the human past, adds another dimension to the picture, the long history of human experimentation with city life. As an archaeologist who studies the cities of the ancient Middle East, I'm interested in the life history of these cities, how and why cities first develop, how they differ from smaller settlements, and why some cities are eventually abandoned. A big part of my work stems from understanding how the multi-species communities that inhabit cities, the people, animals, and things that are interconnected and interdependent, change over time. So why do people in our lines of work study cities? In the earliest days of archaeology, the late 1800s and the early 1900s, Archaeologists were interested primarily in finding beautiful objects that could be put on display in museums or sold to private art collectors. Cities were where the elite had lived, built palaces and temples, and eventually been buried. Therefore, the most impressive pieces of ancient art could usually be found in the ruins of ancient cities. In these early days of the field, then, archaeologists weren't interested in cities themselves. Rather, the archaeological value of cities was as a location for finding important artifacts. This massive statue of a bull-man-bird hybrid, a protective spirit called a Lamassu, was removed from a palace in the ancient city of Dur Sharukin, known today as Horsabad, in northern Iraq, by archaeologists from the University of Chicago, who then brought it back to the Oriental Institute Museum. By the mid-20th century, though, archaeology was gripped by an interest in more scientific approaches to studying the human past. This new scientific approach had two key goals related to cities. The first was to understand the relationship between ancient peoples and their environment. That is, the resource base on which cities depended for food and raw materials. The second goal was to understand the role that cities played in the evolution of human societies from deep prehistory up to modernity. That is, how some past societies shifted from a mobile hunter-gatherer lifestyle to an existence based in densely populated urban environments. By the late 20th century, the scientific turn in archaeology continued, with a focus on using novel methods from other disciplines, like satellite imagery, as new ways to record ancient cities. As these new methodologies were expanding the scope of data collection, archaeologists also began asking new questions. For example, they began to question how we might learn about the lives of non-elite people. They became interested in how we might understand the origins of power disparities. And they began to ask how ancient peoples experienced and conceived of their worlds. Archaeological studies of ancient cities with their diverse populations gave a path forward for answering some of these new questions. Cities are huge, complex things. How do we collect data that meaningfully captures that complexity? Archaeologists gather data about ancient cities in a number of ways, but the most crucial thing to remember is that we can never really excavate a complete city. It's rather impossible, as excavation is such slow work. And even if we tried, it's ethically dubious to excavate any site completely. Excavation is destructive. 
Once you dig a site, you have destroyed the stratigraphy, the layers of accumulated soil. And that's why archaeologists take such careful notes, because when we dig a site, we destroy it. We also leave portions of sites unexcavated intentionally, knowing that methods in the future will be more accurate and less destructive. This means that we also need to be very strategic and targeted when we decide which portions of these large ancient cities we intend to excavate. And making those decisions is a delicate balance of time, resources, and research goals. Most people think of archaeologists as excavators, and many of us do excavate. But there's so much more to it than that. <laughs> Before we begin excavating an ancient city, we study maps and satellite imagery to get a sense for the lay of the land. And then we do a survey. This can involve things like using drones to get a sense of the landscape aerially, or walking across the landscape and recording the artifacts that we find sitting on the ground surface, or the remains of architecture that are still visible. Survey is particularly appealing because it can give you a great deal of information without destroying the site. Archaeologists also use what we call remote sensing technologies to see below the surface of a site without excavating. For example, we can use a technique called magnetometry to measure subtle differences in the magnetism of buried objects. Not just metal objects, but things like walls made of stone will have a different magnetism from the soil that surrounds them. This image here shows imagery recovered from a magnetometric survey of a site in Turkey that dates to about 800 BC. You can pretty clearly see the walls of buildings, roads running between them, and the circular walls of the city, all buried about three to six feet below the Earth's surface. Using non-destructive technologies like this can help us learn about the architectural layout of ancient cities without destroying them. Then we can conduct targeted excavations. If, for example, we were interested in learning about the trade patterns in ancient cities, we might excavate near the gateways, because ancient texts from this region tell us that markets often sprang up near city gateways. Or, if we were interested in understanding how the non-elite lived, we might choose some area of smaller, less robustly built houses to excavate. In part two, we're going to look at some of the implications of this research and also how you can get involved.